come and see the Savior, heaven's invitation, image of the Maker, lying in a manger. Angels fill the sky, singing in the night, glory on high. Come and see the Savior, heaven's invitation. Sing glory on high, sing glory on high. Come see. Come and see the Savior, hope of all creation, healing for the nations, mercy for the stranger. Taken by surprise, shepherds see the sign and worship the Lamb. Come and see the Savior, hope of all creation. Come and see the Savior, promise of the ages, perfect gift from heaven, given now to save us. Following the star, wise men from afar, pour out their praise. Come and see the Savior. Promise of the ages, and pour out your praise, and pour out your praise. Come see heaven's invitation, and pour out your praise, and pour. Good morning, folks. Uh, I hope that you're all doing okay and that you've got um, power wherever you are and, uh, and not had anything fall on top of you that wasn't supposed to fall on top of you or anything uh, uh, weird in your garden that wasn't in your garden before and all that kind of, uh, kind of stuff. Um, a very, very warm welcome this morning to Ellen Parish Church. Uh, as you can see, we're going to do uh, communion. This is the first time, I think, in, in, in about two years um, that we've shared communion together physically. Um, and so I'll give you some instructions about how we're going to do that um, later on in the service so that it's easier to remember. Um, but with the various restrictions and, uh, and those things, we, uh, uh, we need to do it in a specific way. But so I'll explain that to you um, as time goes on. Um, a couple of things just to remind you of, the Team Leaders Hub will meet on uh, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, um, probably in the Kirk Centre, um, and, uh, and also we're starting life groups again. Um, so we, uh, we suspended life groups um, when, um, when COVID happened, um, but we're starting life groups again. They'll start a week on Wednesday, um, and for the first two, we're going to have them in the church. 
um, so that we can uh, work out who's coming and what we're what we're doing and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to do two kind of Advent uh, uh, sessions. Um, life groups are an opportunity to explore faith a little bit deeper and um, to get to know folks, to build a bit of community, um, and, uh, and and just spend some time together. Um, so the seven o'clock, a week on Wednesday in the church. Um, just for a little, a little time, a couple of hours or so, we'll uh, we'll have a, a, a chat and some um, some prayer um, and uh, um, and uh, and some tea and coffee and that kind of stuff. Um, all, all of this, of course, is dependent on the restrictions with the new um, COVID variant um, uh, that has uh, reached the British Isles. We need to be careful, um, and so if uh, if the government changes the restrictions, then of course. Uh, we'll change what it is that we're doing, but at the moment we just carry on um, being careful and, uh, and, and making sure that we're keeping everybody as safe as possible. So I think that's all of the things I need to remind you of um, at the moment. So let's take a moment to still our hearts as we approach God in worship. From a branch sprouting, hope is coming. The heavens are shifting, hope is coming. A troubled world waits, hope is coming. Lord, we your people wait patiently, hanging on with Advent hope. Lord, we bring you ourselves, we bring you our worship. And the first thing that we're going to do in our worship service this morning is to light our first Advent candle. So, would somebody like to come and light our first Advent candle? <laughs> oh, here's James coming. Okay, up you come. Okay, you hold that. Okay, I don't light any of them apart from the top one. Got a wee flame. It's gone out. Hold on. There we go. Try again. I think the light was a wee bit weird. It's <laughs> okay, we'll edit this out of the video. There we go. There we go. Give it a blow. Excellent. A candle burns the first marker of our Advent journey. As we set out, may we travel hopefully. As we set out, as we set out, God of journeys travel with us. And so let us sing this morning together um, the famous and well-known first Sunday of Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
Okay, so today's story is Mary and the Angel. Mary sang a little song to herself as she swept and tidied the house in Nazareth. She was so happy. She was thinking about her, man her wedding day. Mary was going to marry Joseph. How kind he is, she thought, and how clever at making things. Joseph made doors. He made tables and chairs. He was a carpenter. Mary was so busy with her thoughts that she jumped when she heard the voice. She turned to look and her eyes grew round with surprise. For there, by the door, stood a shining angel. Mary knew about angels. God sent them when he had something special to say. And he had, and she had, even, never expected to see one. Angel Gabriel stood there a moment. He did not want to frighten her. I bring, bring good news, Mary, the angel said gently. God has a wonderful plan for you. You are going to have a baby, a very special baby. His name is Jesus. He will be God's promised king. God himself <coughs> will be his father. But I don't understand, Mary said. God will take care of everything, said Angel Gabriel. Nothing is too hard for him. Everyone thought that Cousin Elizabeth would never have a baby. But she will, very soon. Her baby too is part of God's plan. Mary's eyes opened wide in wonder. I shall be glad to do whatever God wants, she said softly. Then, as swiftly as he had come, Angel Gabriel was gone. Mary rubbed her eyes. Had she really been talking to an angel? She was bursting to tell someone. I'll go to see Elizabeth, Mary said. She's sure to understand. Zachariah saw an angel too, Elizabeth said, when Mary had unpacked and they were sitting down together. He came to tell us about our baby. And now God has promised, has chosen you to be the mother of the promised king. Suddenly, Mary felt all bubbly with joy, so happy that she began to sing. Dear God, how great you are, how glad you make me. Everyone will know how you have blessed me. Though I am no one special, for you have done great things for me. You have come to help your people, as you promised long ago. After her visit, Mary went home. God told Joseph all about Mary's special baby, and soon they were married. We pray together. We'll do the family prayer. Okay. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, our children's song this morning is The Angels New.
Let's pray together. Loving God, we offer ourselves back to you in service. We offer our resources, all that you've given, gifted to us. So these gifts are given either through standing order, through our banks, gifts given here this morning, given yearly, these gifts that are given in time, in our talents. We ask that you bless them and you help us to use them to bring your kingdom to this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we invite your spirit into this beautiful Advent season, give us now a sense of your presence. As we bring our prayers and requests to you, enable us to open our hearts and minds to and find time in our busy lives for quiet thought and prayer, that we may reflect upon the wonder of your love and allow the story of your Saviour's birth to penetrate our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father, as the days get shorter and the nights longer, we thank you for this beautiful world and for letting us experience again the miracle of creation in the changing seasons. May we never forget we are stewards of your creation and that we hold it in trust for future generations. Help us to respect the earth's rich diversity and to share with each other and all living creatures in responsible ways. Lord Jesus, you lived an ordinary life in Nazareth with human parents, brothers and sisters. You understand the difficulties faced in families. We pray for all those involved in providing support for troubled families and strengthening our community life. Help us to care more for each other so that the vulnerable are supported and protected. As we draw closer to Christmas, we think of those who are concerned about money worries those who have no homes or who fear losing their homes through lack of finance. We pray for homeless people and for refugees who have no country to call their own. Let your blessing be with those who work to help the homeless this Christmas and give to all of, all of us the determination to help where we can. We pray especially for the safety of migrants crossing the English Channel in search of a better life and we pray for the families of the 27 men, women and children who lost their lives this week. Forced from their homes by conflict, persecution, disasters such as floods and drought and extreme poverty, we pray that the world will hear their plight. We pray that the world will have compassion. We pray that the world will act on their behalf. Heavenly Father, we know, know that without justice there can be no peace. Let peace come when all people are respected, regardless of race and religion. Let peace come when trading weapons of mass destruction is a crime. Let peace come when the earth's resources are used wisely for the common good. Let peace come through the transformation of our lives that we do justice, love and kindness and walk humbly with you. We pray for our church, many parts, yet one body, from north to south, east to west. Help us build your kingdom, kingdom to see lives transformed. May our presbyteries be places of inspiration, support and encouragement. When faced with difficult decisions, grant them wisdom and grace. Lord, we pray for your church here in Ellen, giving thanks for its people and gladly acknowledge all the gifts you have given us. Grant us your help, guidance and support as we work towards the new project and endeavour to build your presence in the community. We pray for those in our community who are lonely. Those who are lonely because they have lost a partner. 
those who are lonely because no one seems to care, those who are lonely because of handicap or illness. Let your presence be with those who are alone at this season of friendship, and may we take your friendship to those we know will be alone this Christmas. Heavenly Father, we too have problems and needs and concerns, worries about ourselves, our families, and those we love. We remember in our prayers today those who are worried about their health and what the future might hold, those who feel anxious or depressed or afraid, those who are in hospital, those with burdens they find impossible to share, those who still mourn the loss of someone dear to their heart. Heavenly Father, calm our fears in the wake of the new South African variant Omicron. Make us vigilant, attentive and proactive to prevent any further spread. Strengthen and encourage those in public health services and in the medical profession who commit themselves to caring for the sick and their families. <coughs> we pray also for families and individuals who are still in the cold and dark following Storm Arwen for the work personnel working tirelessly to get the power back on over a vast stretch of the country. Be with them all in the struggles that they are facing. God of hope, who brought love into this world, be the love that dwells between us. God of hope, who brought peace into this world, be the peace that dwells between us. God of hope, who brought joy into this world, be the joy that dwells between us. God of hope, the rock we stand upon, be the centre, the focus of our lives always, and particularly at this Advent time. All these prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was growing up in New Mexico, um, and I, I'm sure I talk about this every year when, when I uh, speak to people or preach around Advent, um, I had some various traditions for preparing for Christmas, but the church I grew up in was what we kind of called low church, so they were very against anything that had any um, connection to a church that might be considered, you know, close to Catholic or Anglican like that, so very stripped away. And that was just all I knew. So I never heard the word Advent until I was much, much older, just because we just didn't call it that. We got ready for Christmas, but we didn't call it Advent. We had in my house an Advent calendar, um, but it was made of wood, and it had little wooden doors, and my mom would hang it up in the hallway, and every morning when she would wake up, she would put three bits of chocolate in it, one for myself, and my brother, and my sister, and we would open it on the days leading up to Christmas, but Advent calendars like we have here aren't really a thing in, in America so much, unless they are now. I haven't lived there in a very long time. Um, the other thing we would do is we would make um, paper chains. Um, usually, you know, Thanksgiving ends, that's when Christmas begins. If you didn't know, for Americans, Christmas starts after Thanksgiving. And we would um, make paper chains, 25 of them to represent each day leading up to Christmas. But again, we didn't call it Advent. We didn't have that sense of waiting that you have with the season of Advent. And I love Advent. Today is the first Sunday in Advent, and we begin this season of waiting. This morning, we're looking at the text from the lectionary, and we're beginning a new year, and we're starting what is called Year C in the lectionary. So the lectionary is divided into three years, and it's meant to give people a really good grounding in the Bible. So the lectionary has text from the Old Testament, from the Psalms, from the Epistles, from the Gospels. And if you did all of the readings every day for the three-year cycle, you would get quite a lot of the Bible in you. And so it's designed really to help us not just pick and choose, but to get a whole big swath. And so today we begin to talk about Christmas, and in year C we are in the Gospel of Luke. Luke has the most detailed and longest description of the events surrounding Jesus' birth. So given that the lectionary is going through Luke, this year, you might expect us to begin with Elizabeth and Joseph, like Natalie read for us 
with the children's hymn. You might get them hearing from the angel about the birth of John the Baptist, or maybe even Mary and Gabriel in the Magnificat, or maybe even the Nativity itself. But no, the, the text we get this morning from the lectionary is near the end of Jesus' life. And it is a particularly striking series of verses. So before we dive into them, we will hear them read. So Moira is going to come and read our text for us this morning. The reading today comes from Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 25 to 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. <coughs> he told them this parable, look at the fig tree and all the trees. And when they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves to know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the athletics of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will close on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy word. Amen. Merry Christmas, am I right? <laughs> um, what a way to begin Advent. Straight into signs and wonders, the sun and the moon and signs in the heavens, people trembling in fear and traps and all of that. In the context of Luke with these verses, Jesus is ending, nearing the end of his life. And these specific verses are most likely looking ahead to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, which the early Christians took as even more confirmation that Jesus was who he said he was, and that the religious leaders were on the wrong side of history. But what do these verses offer us? There are three images that I want to kind of lift out of this, this text and think about a little bit. The first is the image of the sun and the moon and the, the celestial bodies. The second is the image of the fig tree. And the third is the image of a trap. So we're going to talk about these images a little bit to get us into the spirit of Christmas. But we're going to take them in reverse order. So we're going to begin by speaking about a trap. Did any of you ever watch uh, Scooby-Doo? When you were growing up? I, I loved Scooby-Doo, admittedly one of my favorite cartoons still to this day. I loved it as a kid, and it's uh, no wonder that I still love like Halloween and detective novels and mystery novels and kind of general things that are macabre, um, probably because I watched a lot of Scooby-Doo. 
But you remember how the episodes went, right? The, the, the mystery gang is going about um, their life. They're at a pizza joint or at the beach or doing something. And then they stumble upon some sort of mystery, a, a spooky ghost, a vampire, a knight of some kind is wreaking havoc, scaring people. And the mystery gang decide to find out what's going on. And usually they begin to unravel the series of events and they meet the cast of characters and eventually they get suspicious of a few people and then they decide, all right, we think we know what's happened and we think that this ghost knight, whatever spooky pirate, is fake and we're going to catch them, right? And so Fred usually would devise some kind of trap. And the trap is to catch them unawares, and usually they would have to lure them in, and you would have Scooby or Shaggy or whoever run around, get the monster to chase them, in the trap, trap spung, catch. Of course, it never went to plan. It was always hilarious, always funny, but eventually they would somehow catch the bad guy, and you'd have a scene like this where they unmask the bad guy and find out it's not a spooky ghost, it's just, just you know, Mr. Withers or whoever it is. And um, they would say the famous lines, oh, if it wasn't for you kids and, and you meddling kids and your dog too. I love it, and I never grow tired of it, even though you know it's happening. But this idea here of a trap is to catch someone unawares. The verse is, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness and the anxieties of life. And on that day, it will close suddenly on you like a trap. Now, Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, but early Christians would begin to take these words, not just to talk about that, but to also talk about Jesus' second coming and events that would unfold. It's also good wisdom for us as well as Christians. You fall into a trap because you're not aware of your surroundings. You're not looking at what's happening around you, and you're just going about your life. And as Christians, I think we are called to pay attention to what's happening around us. I think Sandra's prayer was beautiful and was very much the kind of thing that's looking around us to see the world, looking at what's happening in the channel, what's happening with people human beings trying to come to this country, what's happening with the continuing pandemic, all of these things. We have to look around us. What Jesus is telling his hearers specifically about the impending destruction of Jerusalem, but we also hear these words looking forward to Jesus' return. The message is clear. Be ready. Don't get caught like one of the monsters in Scooby-Doo. <laughs> The second image is that of the fig tree. This one is pretty easy to get our heads around. Much like the ancient world, we have seasons and we have deciduous trees. So we understand how it works that a tree has leaves and then eventually they fall from the autumn and then they grow back. This isn't hard. And so we know that when you start to see buds and blossoms and leaves grow on the trees, you know that summer is near. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. This image is focused on a preparedness. If the first image, that of a trap, is focused on awareness, being cognizant of what's going on around us, this is about being prepared, but specifically about seeing clearly when the time is right. The trap is talking about bad things that will happen if you're not aware, but this image is about the kingdom of God being near. And now I think that for the kingdom of God being near, again, if we're talking about the impending destruction of Jerusalem, that is both good and bad. It's good that the kingdom is coming, that Jesus is being confirmed as who he said he was, the temple is destroyed, the old way is passing away. But it was also a really dangerous and horrible time for people living in Jerusalem in the roundabout area as the Romans came through and conquered. They weren't very nice. But it's about being prepared for the kingdom of God is near. And that's, again, the message we can take for ourselves as Christians. Be prepared for the seasons that come. Be prepared for Jesus' return. The last symbol or the first one in the text is the most ominous. 
The people of the ancient world knew a fair bit about astronomy, and they knew about eclipses. They could interpret things from the sun, moon, and stars. Even still, things like eclipses are quite scary things, and you can imagine if you don't really know what the sun and the moon are, other than that they exist in your everyday life, and then all of a sudden there is a solar eclipse or something like that, it would be really frightening. Even if you're not thinking something bad is going to happen, that it's, it's really quite a shocking experience to see. And they would take these events as signs. They would take stuff happening in the heavens as omens or signs. So it's natural for, for Jesus to kind of talk about these things. These symbols, along with the idea of the Son of Man coming on the clouds, come from Daniel 7. That chapter is looking forward to the destruction of Israel's oppressors and the coming of the Messiah. So what Jesus also says is this, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Redemption. That word can also be translated as deliverance or liberation. When we're thinking about Jesus' words here and Jesus echoing the words of Daniel 7, these are verses about liberation, verses about deliverance and about redemption. The season of Advent is about watchfulness. But what are we watching for? We aren't just waiting for Christmas Day. We're waiting for our liberation. We're waiting for our deliverance, for our redemption. The coming of Jesus signals the coming of the kingdom of God and the beginning of a change. We are part of the coming of the kingdom of God now and the liberating acts of the church, liberating this world from those who oppress. Do you see what we're watching for in Advent? I think one of the amazing things about these verses here at the start of Advent, which I will admit when I first looked at this, I thought, this can't be right. <laughs> and I did some Google searching, like, no, no, th these are the verses at the beginning of Advent. But then it started to make sense. My confusion then actually became excitement, because I think this is a beautiful way to begin Advent, a reminder that the coming of Jesus, God enfleshed in humanity, isn't just about Christmas cheer or joy. I watch, I like to watch a lot of cheesy Christmas movies and everyone in them always says, you know, something like, we're families all together and that's, that's what Christmas is all about. You hear that line a lot, that's what Christmas is all about. And you hear that for all sorts of things, you know, joy and wonder and fun and family and all sorts of things just become, that's what Christmas is all about. But I think these verses remind us that what Christmas is all about, what Advent is about that we celebrate every year is the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds, promising liberation, promising rescue, deliverance, action and a change in this world, not just a bit of Christmas cheer, not just a bit of joy, although I love that as much as the next person. But Jesus coming to us in the season of Advent is about far more than that. Advent doesn't just call us to be festive or to be jolly or to spread a little Christmas cheer. This text at the beginning of Advent is a reminder that the coming of Jesus points us to liberation for the marginalized and the oppressed. And that is what we watch for. And that is is what we work for. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for the season of Advent. And we thank you for the reminder that your coming to us is about coming to rescue this earth. We pray that we would work for your good and that in the season of Advent, we would be people who call the world to justice. In all this we pray in the name of your Son. Amen.
So let us continue our worship by singing together our next hymn, <coughs> Longing for Light. <coughs> We're going to celebrate communion in a second. Um, so the instructions um, for what we're what we're doing um, is that um, once I've gone through the liturgy, there will be various parts of the liturgy, liturgy will come up on the screens. It will be a slightly brighter than uh, uh, than you see there. Please join in um, with me with uh, with some of the words as they come up. When we get to the point where we um, where we take communion. Um, Mary is going to say when you can come up. Um, she'll direct you to, to come up. Um, you come up and you take the little white uh, doily thing that's in your uh, in, in your seats in front of you. Bring that up with you. Um, 
One of the elders will um, tong you some bread um, onto, onto that uh, white doily and then come and uh, take a glass of wine and then go down this aisle here um, and then back to your seats and then um, when you're back in your seats you can take, um, take your communion. So come up the middle aisle, um, bread, wine, um, go down this aisle and then back to your seats. Um, when you're coming up, make sure that you leave um, a kind of metre or so uh, between folks so that we're not on top of each other. Um, the reason why we're doing it like this um, is because we're not allowed to pass communion amongst each other. We have to be really careful about how we, uh, how we do this. There are all sorts of, uh, um, there's all sorts of guidance about, uh, about what you're not allowed to do. Um, and, uh, and this is what we've deemed the most, um, the most safe way um, to do uh, communion uh, this morning. Um, the kids uh, will also come through um, and get their communion as well. If you're not clear um, about any of that, then, uh, then ask Mary um, on, uh, on your way. Um, if you have mobility issues or you're not uh, confident to carry anything, if you could indicate to Mary um, and, then, um, and then we'll bring communion to you. Um, so, uh, so don't feel like, you, like, you, like you're going to miss out if you're not, uh, if you're not confident um, with any of that. If you don't want to take part in communion, that is perfectly fine uh, as well. There is no pressure um, to come and do anything. So hopefully that, um, that is clear enough. So let's just take a little moment to still ourselves as we um, come towards communion. <coughs> Gathered round the table is where Jesus so often met people. Gathered round the table of Matthew, the table of Zacchaeus, the table of Simon, the table of Peter, the table of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, the tables of Joanna and Susanna. Gathered round a table where he could see people face to face, listen to their stories and share their laughter. And here, gathered round this table, we are here because this is where Jesus has promised to be for those who want to meet him. So accept his invitation and feel welcome at this table. Jesus Christ, who here offers a foretaste of eternal life, invites you to be his guests. So what we do here, we do because it is Jesus' will. For he it was who once in an upstairs room sat at a meal with his disciples. During the meal he broke bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body, it is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then later in the meal he took a cup of wine saying, he took a cup of wine, and after he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the new covenant with God, made possible because of my death. Drink of it, all of you, to remember me. So we do as Jesus did. We take this bread and this wine, the produce of the earth and the work of human hands, through which Jesus has promised to make himself known. And as he said, a prayer before sharing, <coughs> let us follow his example. The Lord be with you. <coughs> Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and praise. Could I get some water, please? Thank you. It is right to praise you, for you are the one from whom we came and the one to whom we will return. You conceive the universe, wove the world together and hold all life in your hand. You watch us waking or sleeping. You keep every tear we shed. You hear every prayer we make. You know both our best and our worst, and you will not let us go. 
So with rain, wind, and sunshine, with all that moves in time with its maker, we praise you. With angel and archangels, with saints from long ago, with our loved ones who are gathered round your heavenly table, we praise you. With the church throughout the world, Orthodox and Lutheran, Catholic and Reformed, with all who love Jesus and honor his name, we praise you, singing together the hymn of your everlasting glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Yes, blessed is he who was born among us incognito, who grew up without privilege or status, who walked the way to heaven through the back streets of this world, who told the deepest truths in ordinary language, who touched and healed, blessed and disturbed without fear or favor, who showed inclusive love in all its unconditional glory, who for all this was crucified, died, and was buried who for all of this and for all of us rose again, who though high in heaven is present with us here and now. Blessed is he in all his love and beauty, God beyond holiness. As we do what Jesus did, let your spirit move among us to settle on this bread and this wine, that they may become for us the body and blood of Christ, and let that same spirit stir our souls so that as we share this sacrament, we may recognize our Lord and receive him, that he may be in us and we in him forever. Amen. Among friends and gathered round a table, Jesus took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body, it is given for you. Do this to remember me. And then later in the meal, he took a cup of wine. And after he had given thanks, he said, this cup is the new relationship with God made possible because of my death. Take this, all of you, to remember me. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. All you who hunger and thirst for a better life, for a deeper faith, for a better world, here is the bread of life. Feed on it with gratitude. Here is the cup of salvation. Drink from it and believe. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. The angels said it to startled shepherds, and Jesus said it to frightened followers. And now these words which come from heaven are shared to make us whole and to make us one. The peace of Christ be with you. Now you can't shake hands or hug, um, but you can wave peace um, to those who are around you. Unless, of course, you're in the same household, then you can shake hands and hug. Or, you know, you could do this if you really want. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, you have put your life into our hands. We now put our lives into yours. Take us, renew us, and remake us. What we have been is past, what shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us all with you. Amen. 
Just remember that there's tea and coffee um, after the service. If you're staying for tea and coffee, then you need to track and trace. And tea and coffee served at the back. You're not staying for tea and coffee, then if you uh, nip out the side door to save us um, having a bottleneck or anything like that, you're all very welcome to uh, stay um, for uh, refreshments afterwards. And so let's sing together our closing hymn, Tell Out My Soul. So let us go from this place with awareness, with preparedness, but most of all, with watchfulness, for the season of Advent is here. of the
come and see the Savior, hope of all creation, healing for the nations, mercy for the stranger, taken by surprise, shepherds see the sign and worship the Come and see the Savior, hope of all creation. And worship the Lamb. And worship the Lamb. Come see heaven's invitation. See the Savior, promise of the ages, perfect gift from heaven, given now to save us. Following the star, wise men from afar, pour out their praise. Come and see the Savior. Promise of the ages And pour out your praise And pour out your praise Come see heaven's invitation Come see heaven's invitation.